this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm probably going to show the um, over here uh, the pointer, so um, you can look here too if you want. Okay, so the actual title of my talk is Hypotheses and Evidence in Book of Mormon Research. And the main point that I wish to make is that uh, evidence will cause us to change our minds sometimes, and I think this is really important uh, that we uh, not just keep going on with the old ideas that we have when we know that they're wrong. And so I'm going to uh, speak from my own experience and um, uh, to discuss a number of cases where I've changed my mind in my work on the critical text project of the Book of Mormon. So, let's, let's see here. So, we're going to be looking at evidence that can make us change our minds, and there are a number of items. The next two slides will list ones, uh, statements that I now believe are either totally false or can't be shown to be true or are partially false. And I'm going to go through each one of these in our uh, discussion here. The first one is the original text can be recovered by scholarly means. Second, Joseph Smith is the translator, received ideas, and put them into his own words. Three, the witnesses of the translation can be trusted. Four, the Lord prevented errors in the transmission of the text. Five, Oliver Cowdery translated briefly. I'm going to probably forget my numbers here. Six, the 1830 typesetter used P, that's the printer's manuscript, the copy they made, uh, to take to the printer to set the type. And the next one, the copyist for P fell behind in their copy work. Uh, the next slide, we'll see. The translated language imitates the biblical style of the King James Bible. The translated languages uses Joseph Smith's vocabulary. The non-standard grammar represents Joseph Smith's upstate New York dialect. Hebrew-like constructions in the text should be considered literal Hebraisms. And finally, revising electronic texts is a convenient way to create computerized collations. Well, let's look at these. The first hypothesis, the original language text of the Book of Mormon is recoverable. Well, when you start working with the ma original manuscript, you seem to um, think this might be true. And in particular, I list here a number of changes. Uh, these are the correct readings that I discovered as I was doing my work within the first month or so of working on photographs of the original manuscript. Um, those which had come up and were partaking of the fruit, and uh, the word is, the preposition is up. Uh, he also saw other multitudes pressing their way, not feeling their way. Yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God, the word is the way it reads. Current text, they shall be numbered again among the house of Israel, not remembered the wicked are separated from the righteous, not rejected. It is likened unto the being nursed by the Gentiles, not nourished. The Lord hath consecrated this land unto me, not covenanted. So these were all ones that I discovered right off. It's pretty heady to see these. And uh, you think, yeah, we can figure out what the original text of the Book of Mormon was. But, of course, I was working with 1 Nephi and a little bit there in 2 Nephi. And all of a sudden, I realized, where's the rest of it? Well, I already knew it wasn't there. So only 28% of the original manuscript exists, is extant. 
Uh, this is because Joseph Smith put it in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House in 1841, and it was there for 41 years, and uh, mold, water damage did its job. And this gives you an idea of what's, where, what the problem here is. Uh, there are six volumes in the analysis of uh, textual variants of the Book of Mormon. And you'll notice that three of them have an asterisk, one, four, and five. And for these portions of the text, we have, at least for the first, uh, for number one and number four, we have about 75% of the original for that portion of the Book of Mormon. Under five, we have about 25%, but for the other three portions, we have hardly anything. And you can see there, the num these are the number of new readings that were discovered, and I'll just point them out here maybe. So, well, I don't know if it's really showing. But anyway, you can see there's 95 and 93 and 25 for one and four and five, but there's hardly anything. Now we do have the printer's manuscript, P, to help us here, and we have both of them together, but if you look at the totals down at the bottom, we're missing, where it turns out we are going to be missing quite a few readings. And you really can't guess these readings. Most of the readings that you discover when looking at the original manuscript, once you see them, you say, oh, yeah, that really works. But you weren't able to guess them in advance. So um, I ended up with the I've estimated that there are probably 280 unrecoverable correct readings that were in the original text that we will not get by scholarly academic means. It will take the text to be re-revealed to get these readings. Now, it's not that these readings are absolutely crucial, I think, for understanding the text. But this notion which I had that, you know, we can recover this text, this is exciting, um, it made me realize, no, without revelation, we aren't going to get the original text back. Um, and as a consequence, this helped, me, helped motivate me to entitle the Yale text of the Book of Mormon, the earliest text rather than the original text because I really had to keep saying the original text to the extent that it can be determined. And that was a pretty ugly title for the book. So I went with the earliest text. So that's my, the first sort of change that came to me as I was working on the text. It took it didn't take too long to come to this realization. Um, but one of the things which I discovered as I was doing this, that I was getting lots of evidence for a revealed text. And this was different. The general notion that scholars had held over the years was that the text of the Book of Mormon must have been given to Joseph Smith in ideas and that his job was as a real translator to take those ideas, the concepts he was getting, and to put them into his own English. And the main, in fact, only real evidence for this is the English is bad. And since we all know that God speaks good English, namely my English, this must be Joseph Smith's contribution. That is the main argument. And nonetheless, I was finding all of this evidence in the manuscript, the original, that, plus the witnesses of the translation process, that it was given word for word, letter for letter, Joseph Smith could see the text, the translation, and he read it off. B.H. Roberts says this was too easy. Well, B.H. Roberts never got a revelation. 
that way. And the evidence, I think, is very strong that this is the method, that the instrument, Joseph Smith had an instrument, it could either be the interpreters, which came with the plates, later called the Urim and Thummim, or a seer stone that he had. And he could see the text, and he would read it off. Uh, the witnesses of the translation process, I believe, support this. But one of the things you have to deal with here is what counts, who counts as a witness. And I believe that we should restrict this to individuals who wrote down their own accounts. There are two of them listed there, Joseph Knight Sr., Elizabeth Ann Whitmer Cowdery, one of the Whitmer girls. They're in the home at the end, and she married Oliver Cowdery. Or they gave interviews that were published shortly thereafter so that they could, in a sense, have some ability to deal with if there were incorrect statements made in the press and so forth. And we have four of these, David Whitmer, Martin Harris, Emma Smith, and Michael Morse. And Michael Morse is very valuable because he's not a Mormon. He never joined the church. He is the brother-in-law of Emma. And he, all of them say, basically, that they were in the room and could watch Joseph doing the translating. And I'll talk about what they, all six, basically say. Um, okay. So what did they witness? These are the things that I believe we can accept because they could actually see them and go into a court of law and say, this is what I saw. So Joseph Smith would place an instrument in a hat, either the Nephite interpreters or the seer stone. Most of them seem to line up in favor of the seer stone, although Martin said either was possible, but that Joseph preferred the seer stone. Joseph dictating to the scribe for long periods of time. Uh, in fact, that he would usually read off a certain number of words, and the scribe would write it down, and the scribe would read it back. Now, not all of them said this, but a number, a couple of them did. The plates were not directly used, and Emma particularly refers to the plates being wrapped up on the table they were there in the vicinity, but they aren't being used. In fact, none of them say the plates are being used. They all imply that they are not being used by not referring to them. Uh, there is no other use of materials, books, or manuscripts, either by inference or direct statement. And they're all in basic agreement with this. And I think this is important to realize you can always get somebody in a newspaper five years later saying Oliver told me this or Oliver told me 50 years ago that and those don't count and they're usually wacko. They are, they're not like these six. So um, that's the first aspect. Now, just because these people can witness this does everything they say count? And I don't believe so. We have to say, step back and say, now, okay, they could witness these things, but could they witness other things that they claimed were taking place? Two of them in particular, I think, are very unacceptable, frankly. Okay, and this is what they are. They could not see what Joseph was seeing. Two of them claimed that there was a character that could be seen, and the, the, then the translation would appear in Roman letters. Now, whether this is what it was or not, David Whitmer and Joseph Knight Sr. said this is what took place. It's hearsay. I think David said that Joseph told him this. But whether it is or not, they can't witness it. They didn't look. They didn't see it. So we don't really know precisely 
what Joseph Smith saw. We just have to say we don't know. The other one that almost all of them, I think five out of the six say, they believe in sort of an ironclad control of the text. That the instrument itself would not let Joseph move on to the next text unless the scribe got it down accurately. And worse than accurately, letter for letter correct in even the English spelling of common words. They believe this. Many of them say it. And the problem is the, um, the original manuscript tells us it's not true. There are misspellings all over the place, and there are even places in the original manuscript, which we will look at, that cannot be correct. They can't be the right. The, the instrument did let Joseph go on. It didn't stop him. But notice, these people are observing something that I think is making them think there's ironclad control. But what is it? Okay. Well, there does seem to be control over some of the spelling, and we can find evidence for this in the manuscript. And David Whitmer and others said that the Book of Mormon names were being controlled for for spelling. Because who knows how to spell Nephi the first time you hear it? How are you going to know it's PH or F or something else? So they, I think because they saw Joseph Smith spelling out names occasionally, they came to the false conclusion that everything was going to be spelled correctly. But the manuscripts telling us this is, an, is not a correct conclusion. We cannot accept it, and they can't witness it. And anyway, most of them are lousy spellers anyway. How would they know what a correct spelling was? Okay, well, that's just my side comment. Now, we tr Emma said that Joseph, in the beginning, couldn't pronounce some of the English words, that they were difficult, and he would spell them out to her. And I've tried, we don't have the 116 pages when this would have happened, so we try to look elsewhere. There might be one place I found where maybe Joseph Smith might have spelled out a name for one of the Whitmers, Christian Whitmer, possibly. He's prob possibly scribed three in the original manuscript. It's in the first Nephi portion. The first spelling of genealogy is this way. It's a humdinger. But the next two are spelled correctly. Now, maybe Christian Whitmer knew genealogy. He just didn't recognize it and just tried to spell what sort of what he was hearing. But the next two are correct. It could be that Joseph Smith did spell it out the second time it occurred. But this is the only one where we get maybe an actual word of English that Joseph might have spelled out. That's not very good evidence for Emma's claim, but Emma's claim comes from the 116 pages, and we don't have actually anything to back up what she said. But we do find evidence for the spelling out of Book of Mormon names in the manuscript. So here's two of them, I think two very important ones. This is the first time Oliver is going to spell Zenic. And he writes it in line Z-E-N-O-C-K. Then it's crossed out and in line spelled correctly with C-H. And this is the way a, the, a Hebrew name would have been spelled. It wouldn't be spelled C-K. That's an English spelling. This is his tendency to misspell it. And so it's like Enoch. Zenik, it should be spelled like Zenik. Oliver, when he came to copying the manuscript, misspelled every example of Zenik with C-K in the printer's manuscript. He reverted to his natural tendency. And this is why your current text has CK for the spelling of Zenic. But it is CH. 
And this is one showing the spelling out. It was done immediately. Joseph Smith, they didn't come back to it later. It wasn't written above the line or anything. It's in line. It's being done right then and there. This gives support to witnesses saying they were spelling out names, uh, Book of Mormon names. And the next one is the best one, Coriantumr. And Oliver, first time he gets it in Helaman, he spells it T-U-M-M-E-R. And um, then he corrects it. I guess we get uh, something here. Anyway, in line, and he spells it T-U-M-R. And look at that R with this fly, flare at the end of it. He never wrote R ever that way anywhere else in the manuscripts. And it's sort of like, Joseph, how could you expect me to spell this? You can't. And it couldn't even be done by Joseph doing it very carefully. Coriantumr. You still have to do it letter by letter to get MR in English. This is really strong evidence for what the witnesses said. They were spelling out the names. And it is Book of Mormon names. We don't find this for regular words of English, and we don't find it for Bible names. They aren't generally spelling out Bible names. So here's the evidence. So these are scribes two and three, Whitmer's, John Whitmer, and probably maybe Christian Whitmer, Isaiah. Nazareth is twice spelled by scribe three, Nazareth. This is actually because this is a common pronunciation of Nazareth. Nazareth. Not because he mis really misspells it, it's the way he, he pronounces it. And Messiah and Pharaoh. And lest you think Oliver Cowdery is a great speller, I put in one of his Pharaohs. And notice these were left. They went on. The instrument does not stop them. So it's up to them. And they could have, I think, corrected the biblical ones, but they knew that the typesetter, when he got to these, would know how to spell Bible names. He could look them up. You know, they're not worried. But they are worried about Book of Mormon names. So you get the first one at least. And that's very often where we see the correction. And Amalekiah is spelled correctly the first four times, and then Oliver just starts spelling it any old way he wants because they know the typesetter will settle in on the first, what, first spellings of it and know how to do it. Okay. But does this mean every... Can they ever correct a Bible name? Yes. They don't know what a Bible name is. So this one they didn't know, I don't think. Gilgal... And it, it's in Ether, it's the Valley of Gilgal, and Oliver wrote it with two L's at the end, and then he, he later corrected it, crossed out the second L. And so this one got corrected. It is a biblical name, but you can't tell from context that it is. So if, if, if they had asked, you know, how do you spell Isaiah, I think Joseph could have spelled it out from what he was viewing. Um, okay. Now, when they got to the biblical quotations, you know, you're in that Isaiah portion. You've got all these weird names, and they're pretty much misspelled. We don't have the original, but we have the printer's manuscript. They're pretty much misspelled. They're just depending on the typesetter to look up in his Bible how to spell all these names. And he does, but there's one of them he didn't look up. He thought it was right, and it's Ramoth. He did not correct it to Rama. And a lot of people have made a big deal out of this because the ancient feminine Semitic form for Rama, it does end in TH, and so this is supposed to be evidence of the ancient form. In the Book of Mormon text, I think that's really misguided. The reason I think it's misguided is that right before Rama are two examples of there's a Hamoth and there's an Ayoth, two names, 
ending in A-T-H, and I think when Oliver came along, he just wrote Rama as Ramoth, because he just got done doing it twice, and the typesetter just got done going over the Hamoth and the Ioth and thought it was right and never looked it up, and thus they left it. Okay, well, that's my opinion. Now, are there textual errors in the original manuscript? Not just spellings. Are there, is there really garbage in there? I don't want to, I'm prejudicing. Okay. But I believe that Joseph, once he's viewing something, he has got to read it off correctly. The scribe has to hear it correctly. The scribe can ask questions to make sure and they write it down as best they can. Then they will copy it into the printer's manuscript. They will take the printer's manuscript to the printer. The printer's gonna typeset it. They're gonna proof it. They're gonna do everything they can to try and make it accurate. But there is no guarantee that the Lord is going to intervene. And I've never found any evidence of it. No one referring to it the Spirit saying there's something wrong here, find it, or anything like that. There just isn't. And we have these uh, examples. As far as I can tell, the only stage that is actually inspired is what Joseph Smith is seeing in the instrument. And that's coming from the Lord, I believe. So errors were sometimes made, and they're not always caught, and here it is. Middle line, so the Lord, well, beginning of the first line, the Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael and also his whole whole. This is in First Nephi. This is one of the Whitmer boys. And this is what he wrote. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but I wouldn't want it in my Book of Mormon text. Whole, whole. Maybe you could change the spelling of the first whole to W-H-O-L-E. Well, it's a little sobering, but the instrument didn't prevent him from writing this. And maybe he read back to Joseph something that made sense, that was what Joseph was viewing, and so they went on. Wasn't caught. Well, Oliver came to this, and he's going to copy it into the printer's manuscript, and he doesn't like it, so he makes an emendation. I mean, you can't leave this. I don't think you should. So uh, Oliver's emendation is Ishmael and also his household. And my emendation is Ishmael and also his whole household. I've got two holes in there, so to speak. And... I think there's evidence for the emendation that I made because everywhere else, when there refers to a patriarch, in the Book of Mormon, the whole household goes along. Nobody gets a choice of going off on their own. So I think it is whole household. Maybe there's a third option. Maybe you might come up with one. But the point is that the original had an error and it was allowed to get through. The Lord is, didn't stop it. Now, I don't think it's a huge thing, and you can always figure it has something to do with the household, I think. There isn't a hole out in his backyard, and you know, there's no way it's going to be what it actually says. Okay, another one. We know that in the Doctrine and Covenants, it refers to Oliver wanting the opportunity to translate. Did he ever translate himself? And there's one place which when I first saw it in the original manuscript, I thought, well, maybe this is it. it I eventually decided, no, I don't think it is. Uh, where Oliver would take over the instrument and look, and Joseph became the scribe. These are 28 words, the bold ones, that are written in Joseph Smith's hand. 
yea, in every city throughout all the land which was possessed by the people of Nephi. And it came to pass that they did appoint priests and teachers. And then it stops, and Oliver takes over again. It's in Alma 45. It's in the original manuscript. It's the earliest hand we have of Joseph Smith. So is this where it took place? Well, I myself don't believe Oliver ever translated. And I don't think that DNC 9 really describes how you translate. I think what Oliver was trying to get was a confirmation from the Spirit that he should really do this, and he never got it. He just got nothing, and the Lord told him, no, you're not going to translate. But this, and in any event, I don't think is it. And this is the reason why I don't think it is. Well, here it is. You can see it. It's sort of the heavier ink there that's in the middle. Actually, I've got it in red. This is Joseph Smith's hand. He took over. But what I think is the cause is this. Now, that doesn't look very clear. But four lines up above, you see some lines, some words crossed out. And Oliver wrote down, it looks like, he looks like he wrote down garbage. This is the only place in the text where Oliver just wrote down something that's completely rubbish. They had become exceeding, and the last word, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's dissenting. I, I don't think it is anymore. Maybe it isn't any word. He's getting sleepy. And I found when I'm reading to my wife out loud, and if I get sleepy, all of a sudden I will read four or five words which are just vaguely related to what I'm reading, and it's just garbage. And it looks like this is what Oliver did. And four lines later, I think he kept going on for a while, and he finally says, Joseph, I'm just too tired. I can't. i got to take a break. And then Joseph said, okay, but i got to finish what I'm looking at. And we do know from Emma's statements that when he would come back, he, could, he would start up with the new section, which makes me think that he would lose. If he, had, if he had just said, oh, we'll just quit, whatever he was viewing, if he didn't get it all down, they would lose it. So he, I think he sat there and looked and wrote it himself and wrote out what, the, what was remaining, and then they could take a break, and they did. And then they came back and Oliver was able to continue. So I think it's Oliver being really tired, and it isn't him taking over as a translator. Uh, the evidence four lines earlier is showing something's going on, and here it is. Um, okay. They had become exceeding, and it, it really, I don't think it's dissenting. It's something ends with I-N-G, and... Um, that's what you just saw right before. So to me, Joseph took over because Oliver's sleepy. These are real people. You know, we see these lovely pictures, right, in the, in the church art where they got their suits on, it seems like, and everything. They're, they're doing this really, and they all look so fresh and everything. But um, they had to do at least six hours a day of this work, and they couldn't do six hours straight. So they're running up probably about eight, nine hours a day to get the Book of Mormon done. And they get tired. And we see evidence occasionally of it, I think. Okay. So this is a proposal that I made, and I espoused it for 20 years. And uh, I put it in print probably 10 times, a wrong theory, I believe. But um, this, uh, the discovery that the original manuscript was taken into the printers, I discovered fairly early on in my work. And I'm going to show you that briefly here. And then I had, the, I couldn't think of any reason to take in the original instead of the printers except one. So that's what I proposed. 
But uh, we find that for one-sixth of the text of the Book of Mormon, from about Helaman 1317 to the end of Mormon, the typesetter is using the original manuscript. He isn't using the copy, the printers. And all the pencil marks of the fragments we have of the original, they show these pencil marks. The printer's manuscript doesn't have any pencil marks. In fact, it wasn't even cut up by the typesetter. They're just, there's no sign that he ever saw them. And there's some internal evidence, like the 1830 edition misspells Camorra, but if he had had the printer's manuscript in front of him, it's really a U there. He wouldn't have misspelled it, so he must have been looking at something else. Well, he was looking at the original, which had an a, it looked like an A. And uh, Oliver sometimes wrote that his A's and U's sort of mixed them up. Um, oh, this is, yes. So this is from Helaman 15, and there are the pencil marks. The manuscript would come in, either the original or the printers, and it didn't really have punctuation in it, and the typesetter will add it about one-third of the time in pencil, for the most part, to the manuscript, and then he'll set it, but two-thirds the time he'll set it on the run, put the punctuation in as he's going, which is an astounding feat. But here it is, and this next one shows also, this is one the church owns, a fragment from 3rd Nephi 27 showing the punctuation marks. So this is the theory I came up with, the only one I could think of, and for 20 years I believed that the copyists fell behind. And they were supposed to take in the printers, but they hadn't had any problem, this was my big theory, and so they decided to take in the um, original. And this sort of implies they're trying to put one over on Joseph Smith, not let him know, and just take it in, and they'll just set it. But there's some problems with this. And ultimately, on the 5th of August, I remember this day very well, that I changed my mind. And I read an article in BYU Studies by Stephen E. Hatt, where he talks about them taking the printer's manuscript up to Canada to try and get a copyright for it and get somebody to print it to, to protect the Book of Mormon. And apparently what happened in January of 1830 was Abner Cole was publishing, he was in the press, in Sunday, there in the press there in, in Palmyra and he saw these sheets of the Book of Mormon and he decided he'd print them print excerpts. The first published Book of Mormon is by Abner Cole, not the 1830 edition. And so um, in my belief is that they realized that someone could go up to Canada and just print this. So they, they quickly finished up. They were, they were progressing with producing the printer's manuscript as they needed copy, and they quickly finished it up. And they took it, Hiram, we know that Hiram went up to Canada and Hir or excuse me, Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery took the printer's manuscript and a couple of other brethren and they tried to get a printer. This is the famous episode of selling the copyright. They're not really trying to sell the copyright to give away the Book of Mormon. They're trying to protect it in the British realm with U.S. copyright doesn't apply in Canada. So that's what they were really, I think, trying to do. And the evidence works much better now as explaining it. So I had to, it was embarrassing. For 20 years I've been going around saying these guys fell behind when they hadn't at all. It was a much better reason. So uh, they took it up there and this is some of the dates and so forth. And um, then they, they didn't have success, they brought back the printer's manuscript, and then they started taking it back in for ether to the print shop in March, and they finish up the Book of Mormon using the printer's manuscript. But this resolves some questions. There's no evidence they ever got behind. We have a letter that Oliver wrote on the 6th of November, and he says basically they were up to Alma 36, 
That's how far they had gotten. They were about a month ahead of the printer. So there's no evidence at any time that they were really having trouble with keeping up. And were they really keeping Joseph Smith in the dark by trying to do this? They weren't supposed to take in the, the original. But see, Joseph actually would have been up there, and he was with them planning this whole trip to Canada. And then it always sort of bothered me that why, if you just, if you took in the original and typeset it, why would you then make the printer's copy and then go through and proof it against the original to make it accurate? Who cares? But they did. So my whole theory was really had problems, but I never really confronted that until I realized I'd been holding to the wrong theory. So what did I do about it? Is this the first time I'm telling people about this? Confession time? No. So the prompt publication, I, I sent what I'd written up to Stephen E. Hatt, and we discussed it and so forth, and then I published it online, Times and Seasons, and then I published it on the Mormon interpreter um, because they have a print version, and I wanted it in print. And so now I tell people what I now think. And, um, you know, I thought, as, I thought Stephen E. Hatt would have figured this out. I thought everybody, as soon as I read it in BYU studies, I thought, this is obvious. Well, no, I could have kept this thing secret. That is not the way to do research. There are people that do this, though. Well, this is an important finding. And this one I really resisted. I thought I'm, um, has to do with the use of early modern English in uh, the Book of Mormon. And one of the things which you hear all the time is that Joseph Smith's English is a cheap imitation of, of biblical English and, eat, you know, thee and thou and all this kind of stuff. And no one's really gone out and studied it. That I can say. And there are some significant differences, actually, between the, the grammar of the Book of Mormon and the King James Bible. For instance, ETH is used for plurals. They saith in the Book of Mormon text. Most of them have been now removed. That's why people don't know they're there. But there are very distinct differences. But the really striking thing that I finally come to, and I could be wrong, I'm willing to consider alternatives, is that the vocabulary of the Book of Mormon seems to fall within a period of time between 1540s and 1730s. The vocabulary and the meanings are archaic by about at least 100 years, and some of them are almost 300 years old. This is not a 19th century novel. And I don't know anybody out there that's advocating the 19th century novel that's even confronting this evidence that this vocabulary in the Book of Mormon is archaic. Here's some examples. Well, this is the first one that I was confronted with, a researcher of mine, and I, I rejected it totally. So we were trying to deal with Mosiah 1924 after they had ended the ceremony that they returned to the land of Nephi. And a lot of people still love ceremony here. Uh, but I think there's, it's really weird that they're just talking out there in the jungle and uh, about killing Noah. And I know every conversation is ceremonial and so forth. But it just never, it always bothered me. So I had... Renee Bangeter, my researcher, going through looking for any possible word that could replace ceremony. She came up with one, sermon. The trouble with sermon was that the meaning, with means conversation and talk, died out about 1600. So I automatically rejected it. I said, there's no way, can't be. How could you know, it's not in Joseph Smith's language, how could this be? Sermon, meaning 
meaning conversation, when they had ended the conversation. Here's the evidence she found. So out of my brain I made his sermon flow. Doesn't mean he's preaching, it just means his conversation, his talk. And another one also in about the same time period. Now, the word now means a particular kind of discussion, means me up here telling you what you ought to believe. But that isn't what it originally meant in Latin and in English up to about 1600. But I rejected it. Well, the next one I ran across made me start to really think about it. And this one's also controversial. Before, these are two references in the Book of Mormon to being judged at the pleasing bar of God. And uh, actually, if you look up on the internet, pleasing bar of God, besides the Book of Mormon text, you find pleasing bars in Las Vegas and uh, San Francisco and so forth, but nowhere else. Nowhere else. But um, a, a German a legal scholar suggested to me that this was a mistake for pleading bar and I found all kinds of evidence for the term pleading bar from the 1600s. And here's a little bit of it. So there's a town hall museum that refers to the pleading bar where prisoners stood while at trial. You make your pleading, it's a neutral term, you make your case and you stand in front of this bar and the judges are there and the jury and so forth. Couple references to that I found. Then I found it on literature online. And the second one, John Webster was a lawyer. And uh, they're using in these works of literature references to pleading bar. It's like the bar that you, but it's a pleading bar. You make your plea, the legal plea. And I then found it in a, a legal index that there was this term, pleading bar, being used from 1615, I was getting all this evidence that pleading bar. So the bar of God, those two references, one is neutral and one is negative. There's no reference to the bar of God in the Book of Mormon that is positive. And there's nothing that says, you know, we good, we good people, we're going to love it. It's either neutral or it's negative. And one of the pleasing bar ones is negative in context. So now I began to say, I'm going to go start looking. So I started going through the vocabulary of the Book of Mormon. And these are some of the examples I found. And every word that's used in the Book of Mormon that I found in its meaning dates from before 1740. So if Joseph Smith's doing this book, he's using vocabulary that's at about 100 years or earlier, some of it going way back to the 1500s. Well, I don't think he's the translator. It's not being put into his language. That's what I believe. Here's a few more examples. But if in the original text, means unless it was taken out in the 1920 edition for the natural man is an enemy to God and will be forever and ever. But if he yieldeth to the enticings of the Holy Spirit means unless and the 1920 committee put in unless. So you can't see it anymore. Or the next one, counsel the Lord in all thy doings. Now this, uh, this is actually a good one. Maybe we should still have it. You know, go tell the Lord. Just counsel him. Some people want to do this. But originally, counsel, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, up to about 1550, meant to counsel with. Moses counseled the Lord and thereupon advised his subjects what was to be done. The 1920 committee again put in with two times to make sure you didn't misunderstand. And actually, they were right as far as meaning goes. But the original text seems to be really archaic. And I have a third one here if it comes up. So 
the original text, the printer just didn't believe this. He's looking at the printer's manuscript, and it says to smite upon the waters of the Red Sea, and they departed hither and thither, and he just changed it to parting. But in English, depart means to part. And we have a couple, an example from the Geneva Bible. They departed my raiment among them, 1557. But the King James Bible removed, there were quite a few examples in the biblical text of depart, meaning part, removed every one of them, including that one. So the King James reads, they parted my raiment among them. But apparently the Book of Mormon had one. And Joseph Smith couldn't have gotten this by poring over his King James Bible. It wasn't there. And this is a famous one, till death us depart. That's the way the marriage ceremony reads. And in 1662, it had become so archaic, they cheated and they changed it, the Anglican Church, to till death us do part. So you will now understand it instead of depart. But that was a change that was rather nice. The word attitude. I think we earlier talked about this, that uh, God sitting upon his throne, these are words that are identical, two different parts. Jack Welch identified these first, I believe. And notice this word attitude. At about the time of the Book of Mormon, attitude started to take on the meaning, you got a bad attitude. You're, but originally, attitude referred to a, well, a statue's form first, in the 1690s or so, and by 1720 or so, it started to mean in the form, in the position of. And the Book of Mormon has six occurrences, I believe it's six, of attitude, and every one means this. There's no, none that say, layman and Lemuel, you have a bad attitude. That is a modernization, and it isn't in there, okay? So uh, the meaning of attitude, 1725, is the first citation. And I want to point out that I could be wrong on this 1740 sort of cutoff, because I'm looking at sometimes the phrases, and the phrases I can't get early always. So like in the attitude of, I'm only, the earliest ones I'm getting are 1770. So it's up for research. Uh, other 1700s, these are the latest ones, derangement, embarrassment, iniquitous. Iniquity occurred a lot earlier, but iniquitous, you see the earliest citations from the Oxford English Dictionary. But I w I've now gone through all the vocabulary and all the meanings, and I've gotten everything. It's at least 90, 100 years old, it looks like. What about the non-standard grammar? This is the proof that it's hick language, right? This is one of the worst offenders. Yea, if my days could have been in them days. This is Geneva Road language. This shall be your language. And, the, and Joseph Smith in the second one changed it, and the first one was done later in the text. So... But we better be careful. Maybe we're wrong. So I have found this in academic writing in the early 1600s. The wars and weapons are now altered from them days. Four of them logs make a cab. So maybe we shouldn't just rush to judgment and say the bad grammar is Joseph Smith's contribution. Maybe it's actually there. Well, I'm still researching it. Are there Hebraisms in the text? When I found the, these first, I said these are Hebraisms. But as I've investigated them, I discovered I've got to revise this. It isn't just strictly a Hebraism. These are extra ands that are used. I found them first in if clauses. And in Hebrew, if you have, literally, if you translate an if clause, you get something like, if you come, and I will come. You got this extra and. 
We don't like it in English. The original text of the Book of Mormon had quite a few of these. And I identified them, and I thought, this is a Hebraism. But there's a problem. If it's a short if clause in the Book of Mormon, it never has an extra and. They're never there. They only occur in things like, if you come, and surely you should, and I will come. If you have something interruptive, before you get to the main clause, you have the and almost every time. So now, here's some examples, quickly here. And as I cast my eyes round about, that perhaps I might discover my family also, and I beheld a river of water. And that and was removed by Oliver Cowdery when he copied it from the original. He probably thought, oh, that's one of those dumb Whitmers, and I'm taking it out. Yeah, I think Oliver had this attitude. Oh, attitude, there we go, wrong use. <laughs> Helaman 13, and because he speaketh flattering words unto you, and he saith that all is well, and then ye will not find no fault with him. Now, multiple negative, we all relax, it's still okay. But anyway, the and was removed, and so was the multiple negative in the 1837 edition. And there are other ones. There's one with when here. There's one with after. But I've now revised. Let's see. We've got a couple more. And while. And the famous one from Moroni 10 and 4. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart. If it just ended right there and then said he will manifest the truth of it. There wouldn't be any and is what I'm saying. The Book of Mormon structure is more complex than the, the basic Hebrew one. And we just have to step back and say it isn't exactly a Hebraism. We got to refine what we're saying. It's not a proof that it's a Hebraism. So that's a famous one, and Joseph Smith removed that and. Okay. My next to my penultimate. This is one of my really bad mistakes, and I'm paying for it for a researcher to find my mistake. So, you know, when I had a researcher working with me to make the transcript of the original manuscript, I told him, here are the photographs, the UV photographs of the original. I want you to make a transcript directly from the photographs. He said, okay. So he's doing this, and he hands in his transcript, and I've got my transcript, and I start comparing them, and I say, oh, wait. There's some errors here, and all of your errors are 1830 readings. And he said, oh, well, I didn't want to type it in. So I've got this electronic 1830 version, and I just go through it, and when I see from the photograph that it's different, I change my electronic 1830. And I said, no, you can't do that, because you can see that if you miss it, and the photographs are hard to read, if you miss it, you'll end up with 1830 readings in the original manuscript. So he said, okay, I won't do it. So the next time a batch came in, it had about half as many 1830 readings. So he was being more careful, but I had to get somebody else to do it because he wasn't going to do it right. So I knew that you shouldn't do this. Well, and you know, it's hard to do this, by the way. I just give some examples here of one where actually everybody misread the word of the justice of the eternal God. And even both of me and my, my, the person I finally got to do this, we both thought, it's the first full line up there. It's actually the word sword, but it looks like a funny W. And we are all misreading it. So sometimes even two independent, three independent transcripts, we can all make the same mistake. I just bring this up. We have to be, you can't ever say, I have a perfect transcript. It's just that you haven't found all the errors yet. You just keep that in mind. Well, anyway. So here's arrogance and redemption. 
So I thought I could do it, though. So there were three turn-of-the-century LDS editions that I didn't want to have scanned. It takes a lot of work. So I had an 1879 electronic version that we had gotten from scanning, and it was really clean and everything, and I said, okay, I, I and a researcher on each of these three turn-of-the-century editions, we're just going to check it against the electronic, and we're going to find the differences and mark them. Well, we did pretty good on the 1902 and 1906, but there were a few errors. But the 1907, we both goofed. I goofed. He goofed, the researcher. We probably have three dozen errors. Uh, I thought I could do it. You know, my, my research assistant's no good, you know. We had to get rid of him, but I'm, I can do this. Wrong. Nobody can do it. So what do I have in the 1907 edition? And plus the other one's a little bit. I have 1879 readings instead of what's really there. Well, when I did analysis of textual variants, six books, I didn't know this yet. I got a few errors in my analysis of textual variant. I am now confessing that isn't the redemption yet, but I am confessing that I have errors in there. If you have a 1907 reading, you better write me. Most of them are right, but there's a few that are wrong. And recently, someone constructed a text of changes in the Book of Mormon and basically wanted to hide that they were just taking my six books and just copying the changes that I had in there. They did a good job of copying what I have in there. Guess what they copied? The 1907 errors. Sort of proof that they copied it. I sort of like it. That's my redemption. Now, it's not that I plan to do this. Okay, the last thing. I've got to quit here. We have, I have found, as I go through uh, the changes in the text, that if you find these little errors and you undo them, you end up with very consistent readings a lot of the time, 131 of them. The original text is 100% consistent. I've got nine of them here, but the point I want to make is that if there weren't any of these errors in the text, I wouldn't know this. I haven't gone through the whole text looking for every consistent phrase or word use. But the ones where we find the little errors, then I can investigate them and say, oh yeah, this thing's really consistent. So the original text has only the word whatsoever, never whatever. But the current text has two. Actually, one of them was deleted, a third one. But the original text is really consistent here. But I wouldn't know this, except that some typesetters made some mistakes. Or going down, conditions is always in the plural. Under the conditions that you do such and such. It's never in the singular. But in the current text, two of them are in the singular because we expect it in English, and typesetters have accommodated. If they're accidental. They don't intend to do this. And uh, this time, when you refer to the present, the present time, it's always in the singular. It's never in the plural. 60 to 1 in our current text, but 61 to 0 in the original. And there's three more here to keep the, observe to keep the commandments. One has lost to keep. Thus ended a period of time, never thus endeth, but there are four of them in the current text, to do iniquity, never to do iniquities. And um, if it be so, not if, no, if it so be, not if it be so, to have hope, not to have hoped. The Nephites and the Lamanites, it's never the Nephites and Lamanites, you don't throw out the the. But notice, Without errors, if there'd been no errors, I wouldn't have discovered these, and it probably means there's more than 131 of them. There's a lot more. Now I gotta figure out a way to find the other ones, but I know they're out there. So ultimately, there is some redemption in errors. 
And without the heirs, we wouldn't find, discover things about this text. So I will close with a wonderful excerpt from a poem, Pied Beauty. You may have read this a long time ago. Glory be to God for dappled things. These are all fancy words. You can look them up. For skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim. He fathers forth, he creates, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. So ultimately, I'm grateful for all the little wrinkles in the text because they tell us how they translated, tells us what they did, tells us, I believe, that this text was a revealed text from the Lord word for word, and that's what I've been arguing for for a, a long time. We just have to get past the fact that humans have been involved in this text, but behind it is the Lord, I believe, who doesn't change and who fathers forth all of these things. Thank you very much.